open our Bibles to 1 Samuel again. 1 Samuel. Thank you for being at God's house. Good to see everybody. Amen. 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 1 Samuel 11. I pray that you're not like many Christians who don't even have a Bible. They come on Sunday and live like hellions the rest of the week and then go back. It's not a thing that we just do. This is a place of spiritual importance. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everything in life is spiritual. We need to live by the Word of God. We need to eat it. We need to drink it. We need to live by it. We need to do it. Amen? First Samuel yes. chapter 11. <coughs> we... Uh, looked at 1 Samuel chapter 9 last week. I'm skipping 10 on purpose. Uh, I felt that God would have me do that and go right into chapter 11. I don't normally um, stay in the same book if you know me, if you've been here for a little bit. You know we jump around a little bit, but I just felt God was leading me to preach something around these lines. And so, uh, uh, but last week we looked at uh, the son of Kish. His name was Saul. He became and was anointed king of Israel, the captain of the host. Uh, we spoke last week that Samuel was the one in, in chapter 10. We'll just skim it real quick. Uh, he's the one who poured the oil upon the head of Saul. Uh, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And uh, Saul went, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He prophesied. Uh, he got the asses back. He came back uh, to his dad. And uh, all the people came out. They had um, uh, chosen uh, Saul there, and uh, he hid himself among the stuff where they tried to find the king. And uh, people said, hey, God saved the king when he finally came out. And now, uh, so just with that very brief um, uh, introduction in mind, that, that you have a little bit of what's going on, kind of gets you back into the game. Like, what did he preach on last week? It was about divine appointments, right? And so, uh, but now, getting our heads in the game and thinking, where has Saul been? What's going on? Saul just got anointed. Saul just became uh, king, chosen by God. Um, and verse 26 said, and, and Saul went home to Gibeah, and there went out with him, chapter 10, verse 26, uh, a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him. They despised Saul and brought in no presents but he held his peace. Uh, so with that in mind, Saul has now just been anointed. He has been chosen, right? Uh, they put in, they cast in their lots. Uh, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen, Saul. And now chapter 11 says, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, uh, he says, on this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all of your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. Thank you again for this lovely day. Uh, thank you for this place, this building, this property, these people uh, that would come and hear the word of God. I pray that you open our minds, open our hearts. Uh, I, I pray, Father, that you would remove all distractions from this place. I pray that Satan and the angel of hell would be able to gain a foothold uh, in this service and that we would pay attention and hear what the Spirit has to say uh, to us this morning. I pray if there's a soul here that's not saved, I pray today would be the day of their glorious salvation for whom Christ died. I just pray uh, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we see, number one, the situation here. A man, Nahash, who was an Ammonite, uh, who came up and encamped against Jabesh. Gilead, Jabesh Gilead was on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And you would know, uh, if you know your Bible, you would know that their fathers uh, 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 um, stayed on that side because there was a, they had much cattle. And they told Moses before they went into the land, hey, can we just stay over here because this is a good land. That's not having faith in God, by the way, for the promised land. Amen. That would be the best land ever, amen, amen, that God had prepared for them. But they wanted to settle for second best. And you still have Christians that want to settle for second best. That's amen. a separate message. Uh, but just uh, just side note there, uh, 599 out the door. Uh, then we see the request. So we see that Nahash, this Ammonite, an enemy of Israel, is encamping against this city. They set up and, and, and make sure that no one can leave and they want to besiege the city and say, hey, uh, we're going to come attack you. And they know that. They know the Ammonites. They fought them before. Uh, they are a, a relatively um, uh, dealt with older enemy of Israel. 
and all the mess of all the all the men of Jabesh. So these Israelites tell Nahash and ask him a request, and they said, "Make a covenant with us, and we'll serve thee. Make a covenant with us. Make a promise with us that you won't kill us, and if you make that promise, we'll serve you." Hold up. That was the fastest response to an enemy that I've ever seen in Scripture. Uh, it's like the football team, the home team on the football team, uh, on the home field, the enemy shows up to their field, right? The opponents, we call them the enemy, if you ever played sports, the enemy, right? Attack them. And they show up to your home field. Pretend it's homecoming day. Think of like a college game. Kids are crazy, right? Ah, right? And uh, so the home team is there, everybody's there, the crowd's there, and everybody's all excited. And then the enemy comes, the opponents come, and the home team looks at the enemy and says, we forfeit, we're done, we're done. What would the rest of the crowd say? Wussies, right? <laughs> it's, uh, you guys are terrible. This is, the, this is Israel. This is God's people. Amen. But they're saying, hey, make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. What in the world are you talking about, Jabesh? Uh, why are they willing to serve the Ammonites? Uh, why were they so hasty in their response to the enemy? I believe because it was they were not trusting God. Amen. They saw the physical and let it take over their faith in God. Amen. And we too, if we're not careful, will see the physical, we'll see, because that's just how we are, that's how God made us, Amen. we'll focus so much on the physical and not see God working in the in behind the scenes. Amen. Or we won't have faith in what God is doing in the situation. God wants us to have faith and move Amen. forward with Him by faith and not focus on the physical. Amen? Amen? So be careful in that aspect. That's not even part of the message, but that's just good preaching. Verse 2 says, And Nahash, the Ammonite, answered them. So there was this request given, make a covenant with us. Now there's a condition. It says, And on this condition, Nahash, the enemy, is telling Jabesh Gilead, Israel, to... He says, look, I'll make a covenant with you. Sure, I'll do that. On this condition, though, that I may thrust out all of your right eyes, sorry, your right eyes, and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. So Nahash says, yes, I'll make a covenant with you, but the condition is in this covenant, uh, I need, you need to allow me to basically thrust out all your eyes, gouge out all of your eyes, your right eyes. Uh, uh, why? Because that's how everybody shoots, right? <laughs> uh, but to gouge out your eyes. And I would say, well, what's the reason for that? Well, not only to incapacitate them from further or future warfare that their men would need, but also to, he said it here, lay a reproach upon all Israel. To lay a reproach. Uh, the enemy flat out tells them that the condition uh, to be met and that they're going to do, and the reason for it is to blatantly, openly, he says, to bring a reproach upon Israel. Why? Because everybody hates Israel. Ding, ding, ding. What's all in the Amen. news? Everybody hates Israel. Ding, ding, ding. We have a president that's anti-Semitic, right? Or is, Amen. It's just insane. Everybody hates this tiny little country that God still has a plan for. Amen. Amen. And wants to destroy this thing off the face of the planet. Why? Because it's God's people. Amen. And God's people have always been persecuted. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. Uh, don't You don't have to seek persecution if you're living godly. Amen. Amen. Uh, but they want to destroy Israel. So then he asked the question, well, Pastor, what is a reproach? What is bringing a reproach upon Israel? Um, reproach just means a shame or disgrace. So what does that have to do with this? Well, the enemy says, well, I want to thrust out your eyes, and because you are submitting to me and I'm going, you're going to allow me to do that, that is therefore going to bring shame and despising upon your people. Amen? Amen. Uh, this is going to be a reproach upon all of Israel, and that should be um, a high offense against these men, right, in Jabesh Amen. Gilead. Look at verse 3. It says, And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel, and then, if there be no man to save us, we'll come out to thee. What in the world? The, the, I think that response is even more alarming than saying, I'm gonna, I'm, the condition, I'm going to gouge out your right eyes. I think that response is that, hey, uh, yeah, just give us seven days, you know, let, give us a break real quick, and we're going to go find out who's going to help us, and if they can't, then, then we'll let you do that to us. What in the world? What kind of man are you? <laughs> Amen? Uh, so I'm just saying, they weren't even upset about the reproach, they didn't care about their eyes being couched out. 
uh, they considered it and thought, well, I guess this is it. I guess this is it. I guess that's what's going to happen. And uh, might as well just tuck tail and run. Uh, maybe one person in that group just said, hey, let's go ask our brethren, right? And uh, if you remember, as I said earlier, uh, when, when the tribes of uh, Israel were going into the promised land, Reuben and Gad made their request to stay on the east side of the Indeed. Jordan River, right? Because it was, much, it was a good land for cattle, they thought. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and they settled in Jazir and in Gilead, and we're looking at Jabesh Gilead, which was a city, okay? So I said, hey, give us seven days, we're going to go into, over it, over the Jordan, go look around all Israel and bring word and say, hey, we need some help, all right? Uh, so, uh, they're still not cut off by their people, right? Just because they're separated by a river doesn't mean they're cut off by their people, they're still all Israel, Right? They're just separated by a little river. <laughs> but they would take that way too far. So it, it amazes me, in verse 4 he says, Then came the messengers to give you of Saul. So therefore we know that Nahash permitted the men of Jabesh Gilead to go. Right? We see that? I don't want to lose you. We understand that. Nahash the enemy said, Okay, I'll give you seven days. Go on ahead. That's a really nice enemy. That's a really good guy. Right? Yeah, I would think so. Like, oh, that's great. I, you know, I fought in Afghanistan. I'm, uh, if, if the enemy said, hey, we'll give you a seven-day break, I'd be like, praise the Lord. That'd be great. I'm, I'm already running out of ammo. probably going to die. But seven days would be a loss and that I can actually eat another MRE of food I don't like. Right? So uh, it amazes me that Nahash permits these men to go and get this help. The enemy is saying, yeah, go ahead and go do it. Go do it. Almost like a pride thing. So, but if you're on the offense, thinking military terms or even sports terms, if you're on the offense uh, and you understand from a military perspective that you can take the city right away, right? The men are so scared of you and you can take that city and just destroy it and utterly just whatever, you, you would do it, right? You don't want to waste an opportunity. Amen. Just like the Democrats, they don't want to waste a good crisis, right? Sure. Hello. <laughs> So we have a so we see here the pride of Nahash, the enemy, letting them go. And what I see is that he's seeking to gain a greater glory um, by defeating a somewhat, in his mind, a larger enemy that he's going to demolish anyway. So he says, "Yeah, go ahead and do it. I double dog dare you to do it." Right? I don't even think kids say that anymore. <laughs> do it, otherwise I'll get you on Facebook, right, or Instagram, or Snapchat, or something. Have you looking stupid, right? Uh, so people uh, are now leaving from Jabesh Gilead. Some men are going across the river and going over uh, here in verse 4. It says, Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul. What happened to King, or what happened to Saul class? He was just anointed king, Amen. right? And they told the tidings in the ears of the people, and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And this is how you know Saul, before this time, was a humble man. He was a man of, uh, a, a very careful man. He was a, he was a humble man. <laughs> Notice verse 5. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. He was just anointed king. What's he doing in a field with some sheep? I've never seen that before, but that's good stuff. And Saul said, what aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the things of the men of Jabesh. So now Saul gets wind of the situation after returning from the field where the sheep and the pastures were, and he asked, hey, why are these people weeping? So in Gibeah, Saul didn't know it at the time, but in verse 4, when those messengers came from, I, if I, am I throwing out too many names here? Like, I don't know, Jabesh Gilead, whatever we're at. So if this is Jabesh Gilead over here, I'm going to say this is Israel. So Jabesh comes over to Israel. I mean, they're Israel, but they come across the river, and they go to Gibeah where Saul's at, and they tell the men and the people there, and they're all weeping. Saul's out in the field tending to the sheep. He comes back and says, why is everybody weeping? I can hear them all the way out in the back 40. What in the world's going on? And, and this is what they say. The, the, uh, uh, Saul came and says, why they weep? They told him all the tidings of the men. What, what, what tidings? What did they tell him? Well, they told him the bad news that um, maybe not necessarily they told him that they were going to allow them to gouge out their eyes, but that there's some wicked people here called the Ammonites, and they want to destroy our city. Amen. We need help. They gave us seven days. Saul's so like, oh, okay, well, now that that happened, now that I understand what's going on here, and I get a debrief of the situation and get blindsided by this like leaders always do, 
Verse 6, And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. He heard that uh, Nahash, the enemy, wanted to bring a reproach upon Israel. Saul got ticked off. It says, And his anger was kindled greatly against the enemy. Okay? It says, How dare they? Uh, why was he so angered? Because I believe Saul was zealous for God. Saul was zealous yeah, for God. Right, yeah. And the enemy came to defy God and bring a reproach upon Israel uh, and make Israel, uh, what other places in the Bible would say, a laughing stock or a gazing stock. Uh, and, and all the nations, it would give them an opportunity to laugh and mock at God's people and God himself. And it would put Israel down and put them into shame uh, for the enemies and future enemies would know that their God cannot protect them nor deliver them. That's the whole reason for the reproach. Amen. Amen. The whole reason for the reproach is to bring shame upon the enemy. Because you know shame is one of the, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say motivating factors, but shame is a very real thing, right? Amen. Why do we wear clothes? Because of our shame of nakedness, right? Amen. Because of our sin. Right? It wasn't J Charles Darwin and birds and finches are changing outfits all the time just because they want to. No, we wear clothes because of sin. We cover our nakedness. We cover our shame. Uh, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, God says, Adam, where art thou? If God is all-knowing, why would he say, Adam, where art thou? It's a picture of sin that separates us from God. Right? He says, Adam, where art thou? And he says, oh, I was over here. And he came out to God, covered himself in fig leaves. Uh, his own works, by the way, which does not provide <laughs> salvation, God says, hey... Uh, because of that, I'm kicking you out of the garden, but before you leave, I'm going to kill a lamb, and I'm going to cover you in skins, because it's by the blood, amen? amen. It's by the blood of God that we're saved, amen? amen. amen. All right, amen. a couple of y'all nodding your heads, I get it. So anyway, the, the, Saul's anger was kindled greatly, because I believe Saul was zealous for God. He didn't want a reproach to come upon his people, amen. that now he's going to be the leader of, that they just rejected God, but now they want this king, uh, but still... I believe that is the reason that Nahash want, that told the men of Jabesh Gilead uh, the, the covenant condition, which was, I want to lay a reproach upon you. I want to make you a disgrace. I want to make you so shameful that everybody and their mama is going to point and laugh at you to shame. That's, that's some tough stuff to swallow. Amen. And these men were like, oh my goodness, I mean, we got to go find someone to help save us, right? And they said, they, 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 we, we got to have some man come, come help us. And so Saul now hears of it. He's furious. And it's interesting that he just got anointed king. Like literally, the, first, the, the chapter before this, he just got anointed king. I just showed you that. Uh, and that was privately he got anointed, but then he got called out in front of the tribes. And now publicly he's chosen and he's declared king. People say, God saved the king. And now, right away, is a test. Amen. Right away is a test for the leader. And a test that would prove his leadership skills, his ability. It would challenge his wisdom. Uh, it would challenge his courage, his strength, his zeal. So what does Saul do? What does Saul do? What does a leader do in this situation? There's an enemy knocking at the door uh, several miles away. And he, now there's men and women and children that are going to be uh, 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 hurt by these people. Uh, because if you didn't know, the Ammonites were a very wicked pagan people. Uh, according to, I think it's Amos, Amos or Joel, they would go in and rip up pregnant women and rip the babies out. That's how wicked of a people they were. So you can imagine then the, scare, the uh, frightening men and women of Jabesh Gilead. Okay? So I don't want to knock them for not being afraid. Because if that was my enemy, I would be very afraid. I'm even more afraid of the Mexican cartels than I am of the Taliban. Because I know how wicked they are. Amen? Amen. Like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but they are, I'm telling you. They're really bad. Uh, if you've known anybody, I've known people that have been chopped up, body parts. It's, it's crazy. It's disgusting. So anyway, what does Saul do now that he's furious, his anger is kindled against the enemy, he understands and he's zealous for God? He says, how dare they try and bring a reproach upon God's people, who I'm the leader of now. What did he do? Verse 7. He took a yoke of oxen, that's two, and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out with one consent. They came out with one consent. So, get this, Saul hears of it, he's so mad, 
He just goes out and slays a couple oxen. And he cuts them all up into pieces. He says, ah, and he starts going crazy, right? Cutting up some oxen. For what purpose? To get the people to realize that the king meant business. Amen. He says, this is not a game. He says, this is real. This is life and death situation. People are going to be hurt. I need to do something drastic. And the people are probably like, oh my goodness, this guy is not playing around. Right? Yeah, kind of like when, uh, and every family is different, but most moms, they're very kind, very patient, very loving. Right? Say, don't, don't, don't smack your mother in the face. Right? Don't do that. Right? And then when dad comes home, oh no! Right? He's going to take care of business. Just wait until daddy. Anybody ever get told that when you're a kid? Wait until your father gets home. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Right? But then other moms, I think of Mexican cultures, they got the chancla, right? They just whip it around the corner. Oh! Are you to me like that? Right? Then you got other kids like, I can tell my mommy whatever I'm going to do, right? But then daddy comes home. Daddy's the king here. He says, I ain't playing around. Amen. If I tell you to clean up your room, you need to clean up your room. Amen. Uh, anyway. So, to get the people the king the, that he meant business. So, if you don't go fight for Saul and Samuel, the, Saul says, then your oxen, your livelihood, and not everybody had oxen. If you had oxen, you were well off, right? You had to borrow your neighbors, kind of like you got to borrow your neighbor's lawnmower or your blower, and then you take five weeks to return it to them. Return your stuff. So, he says, I'm going to take your oxen, I'm going to take your livestock, your livelihood, and if you don't follow me and Samuel... You're going to face, and your animals are going to face, the same that these oxen face uh, of the pieces in your hand. We get the picture? Yeah. Saul's not playing around. Saul said, look, you better come follow me or else. Right? You better do what I say or else. Amen. That's a king. That's a monarchy, right? He says, you better follow me or else. And what purpose did that serve? What was the result? The Bible tells us in verse 7... At the end, he says, And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the people, and they came out with one consent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? They're all lining up now because King Saul ain't playing around. He's in business. Uh, a, a side note, I'm sure all Israel knew about the Ammonites, right? We said that how wicked of a people they were, how fierce they were. Uh, maybe that's why they all wept when they heard the news because these people were very bad, right? They were very Amen. wicked people. And now all Israel, instead of weeping, all Israel is now fearing lest that thing that Saul just did happen to their animals. So notice the Bible says that, and they all came out with one consent. They were all yes. unified. They were unified. What unified them, class? Was it Saul's oratorical skills and his pleasant velvety words? Uh, was it the payout of a bounty who got the head of Nahash the Ammonite? No. Notice it wasn't any of those things, but it was the fear of the Lord fell upon all the people. The fear of the Lord. That's how we know God was with them, because the fear of the Lord fell upon all the people. And let me tell you something. Not until you have a healthy fear of the Lord uh, will you ever live your life more fervently, more zealously, uh, more wisely, carefully, and holy than if you didn't have the fear of the Lord. Amen. Amen. When we get a dose of the reality of God's holiness, who God is. Because that's one of the most important things, is you understand who God is Amen. and who you're not. Yes. We do not elevate ourselves. We don't sing that in our music. We don't do that in our teaching. I hope we don't do that in our homes. Uh, I mean, we all struggle with pride to some degree. I understand that. But when you, get a, when you get a dose of the holiness of God, when you get a dose of His goodness, His grace, His justice, His wrath, and who He is, it will draw you to your knees. It will drive you into the fear of the Lord, uh, a healthy fear of God. Uh, the psalmist would say, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for it, there is no want to them that fear him. So needless to say, these men of Gibeah hustled up, or sorry, these men of Gibeah hustled up to Saul real quick. Amen. Real quick. He says, Hey, I'm going to cut your oxen up if you don't follow me and Samuel, or else. Right? Kind of like... I think of like the, uh, what's a good word I can use for this? I was asking my wife last night, what did I say? Uh, a nice word, because I don't want to offend anybody. The husky kid. There you go. The husky kid. When the husky kid sees the ice cream truck and he's got that dollar, he going to run, boy. He going to get it, right? He, so these men in, 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 in Gibeah here, when they saw that, when, when he's laughing, I got that steak, man. Uh, he going to run. When the men saw that and they saw the pieces, 
that Saul caught up, they said, Whoa, I'm out of here. I better go follow King Saul because, or else, that's going to happen to me. I don't want that to happen to my family, my livestock. Not that he's going to kill them, but the livestock, right? I have to pay bills, man. So they were running. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people. And they came out with one consent. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. So now we have 330,000 men. That is a huge number. Amen. You want to get some volunteers for some voluntoldies? Do what Saul did. Do what Saul did. I've always been, I, I said, I, I think we should institute the draft and have everybody in, in, in America serve in the military. <coughs> Maybe not women, but definitely men. I think politicians should be military yeah. veterans. I believe the president yeah. should be a veteran. Hello, who was it? Yeah. Theodore Roosevelt, right? That guy was a beast. So do what Saul did, drafting kids in the military, drafting boys in the military. Here's what you do in America. You threaten to take away their gaming system. Amen. You take away the, you, you say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna take this away unless you enlist. And when they do enlist, you'll have a generation of young men who are on fire for their country. Or they're on fire because they don't want their Xbox on fire. Amen. 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 Oh man. Uh, verse verse eight. So when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel, three hundred thousand, the men of Judah thirty thousand. So that's a ton of men, and I would venture to say that most of them desired to be, or a, a good chunk of them, desired to be obedient. Amen. They desired to be obedient because they didn't want their livestock destroyed. That was, the, that was primarily probably the reason. But I still believe, too, that there were some who desired to help out and fight for their brethren, and they were touched, as Saul was touched, because he was zealous for God, because he didn't want the reproach to come upon Israel. There's still a few good men. Amen? Amen. Just, just because you have a few that are public and made known and ruin it for everybody, that's why we talk about homeless. When a homeless man told you about in Sunday school when I picked him up and he gave him food and all these things. He said, it's just nice to be treated like a person. Amen. I said, what do you mean? He says, because you get the stigma and everybody looks at you. You see it in their eyes. You're a, you're a drunk. You're a druggie. You're, a, you're just an addict. You're a nobody. You're a bum. He says, it's nice to be talked to like a person. I said, Amen. And the Christians should be showing the love of Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, so anyway, uh, 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 thinking on that aspect militarily wise, Saul said, y'all better come. I'm going to cut them up. Most of the men probably came because they're like, I don't want that to happen to my animals. Amen. But still there was some, a few group that said, hey, we're going to come because we heard of the news uh, about the men in Jabesh Gilead, and we don't want to bring a reproach upon Israel. We're zealous for God too. Let's go fight. Right? And there's still men like that in the military, by the Amen. way. Amen. Uh, so we still have a lot of good young men and women serving in our armed forces, and praise God for that. Amen. Amen. So Nahash then, Nahash. Remember we said Nahash, the enemy, said, yeah, I'll give you seven days rest. I'll give you seven days to go get that. Bring it on, right? He totally miscalculated how many men would be there at that battle. Amen. He did not understand. He miscalculated the size that uh, Israel was going to send, right? And to his shame, right? So verse 9 uh, this is the response that the men, now that 330,000, King Saul says unto the messengers, Thus shall ye say to the men of Jabesh Gilead. Those men that came from Jabesh came over to uh, Gilboa, right, and told Saul, Saul got all of his men. They say, Hey, messengers, go back to Jabesh and tell them the cavalry is on the way, yeah. right? So he says in verse 9, he says, Tomorrow, by that time, the sun be hot, which in Phoenix is probably about 9 o'clock. But there, uh, maybe a little later, uh, ye shall have help. We need to search for help. Ye shall have help. Amen. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh. And what happened? They were glad. The men, the men said, hey, I don't know who's going to be able to save us. I guess this is it. We're going to have to gouge out our right eyes. I really <coughs> like this eye. I had a freckle in this eye. It was really cool. My wife liked it. Now it's going to be gone. Right? And they go over here. And then they say, hey, go tell them we'll be there. He says, hey, guys, they're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Hang on. Hang on. They're, it, they're going to be here by tomorrow. It's good to have a timeline, by the way. Amen. But in the military, when you get a timeline, it always fails. You always have another plan, another plan, another plan. It's just continuous. But I'm glad they were able to keep this promise. Verse 10 says, Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we'll come out unto you. Who's talking? The men of Jabesh. Don't lose. I don't want to lose you. The men of Jabesh are telling Nahash, the enemy. They Amen. just heard the news, relayed the message that Saul and his troops are on his way to save us. Now they tell Nahash, hey, 
tomorrow, um, we're going to come out to you, and you shall do with us all that seemeth good to you. They're like, oh, that's a little trickery. That's, 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 I don't think that's very honest. Uh, but he says, uh, I don't think they were lying because why? Well, they didn't tell him that Saul wasn't coming. They didn't say that they did have reinforcements, right? So Saul had to take action very quickly. Otherwise, the situation would have got out of control, right? He only had a week or so, seven days. Uh, but because in war, a leader needs to be decisive. Amen. A leader needs to be decisive. And as does a leader of a nation, i.e. the border crisis. Amen? Like, no, I, I don't know what's going on. He responded as the first American president to recognize Armenian genocide. That was 160 years ago. And the people of Turkey are not happy about it. Amen. Amen. I would rather have a leader that deals with the home front first. Yeah, our amen. backyard. Amen. Hello. Amen. Be decisive. How long was it? Three weeks? Five, I don't know how many weeks it was before something even came out. Wow, a leader needs to be decisive. Start doing something at the home front. But Saul took action very quick. Amen. Saul took action very quick. He had to. The <clears throat> army was encamped against the men of Jabesh Gilead. And so the clever men in verse 10 of Jabesh, they said, look, we're going to come out to you. And uh, now did they lie? Well, no, they, they didn't say they had reinforcements en route. And so them telling the enemy said, hey, tomorrow at noon, we'll come out. Why noon? Because that's when they said that Saul would be there. It says, hey, by noon, we'll come out to you. You want to do with whatever whatever you want to do to us, that's fine with us, as long as you don't kill us. So they, they didn't necessarily lie to the enemy, but they did say they will come out at noon, and they're going to yeah. keep their word. Okay. <laughs> so in that aspect of the enemy, like, this is a walk in the park. This is a cakewalk to the enemy. They have no idea that Saul and his army are coming. That the men of Jabesh Gilead just willingly said, hey, give us seven days. They came back within a couple days and said, hey, tomorrow we'll come out. And so the enemy's like, this is nailed in the coffin. This is done. Where this is easy. So it put the enemy at ease. That's right. Amen. In a sense. It put the enemy at ease in a sense. So verse 11, and it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies. The next day, like they said, <coughs> And they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch and slew the Ammonites into the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. That's a great slaughter. Yeah. So Saul made three companies, one on a frontal assault, two on the flanks. And they attacked in the morning watch while everyone was sleeping. While everyone was just kind of waking up and they slew the Ammonites into the heat of the day, which they told the men of Jabesh Gilead that that was the time that they were going to be there and that they were going to help them, right? Yeah. So that indicates for us the time in which Saul and his forces showed up, which was when? Way before the time appointed. Mm -hmm. Way before the time appointed. Very early. So that means that Israel had to go up and get, out, get from Bezek over here and get over to Jabesh Gilead really quick. Amen. Very decisive. And so verse 12 says, And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. What is he talking about, class? Well, if you go back to chapter 10, verse 27, But children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presence. That's the men who Israel's talking about now. So after this great victory, they say, hey, those people who said, shall Saul reign over us, let's kill them. Let's go after those people, our own people. They, they wanted to put those men to death. And so I'm sitting here reading this, and I'm like, really, guys? After this great victory, that's your only thought? Let's go kill the ones who didn't want to follow Saul. Yeah, let's get them. Right? And isn't that how it goes after a great victory? Hey, we did this great thing for God, but they didn't do anything. Be careful. Be careful. Remember when David left the stuff and the men were too weary to go after their women and children? It says, you guys guard the stuff, we'll go. And then when they came back with all that they had, and even more some that God blessed them with, the men that went with David and fought, they said, hey, these men don't deserve all this stuff. He says, no, no, no. He says, those that stayed by the stuff are the same partakers of those that went. Amen. Because, and it's the same thing in soul winning, by the way, when those who are able to go out and do the work, 
those who are not able are watching the stuff and holding the home front through prayer. Amen. That's a Amen. good principle. Amen. Pray. Right. Why? Because they need the power. They need Amen. the power of God on their life to witness to a lost soul. Amen. Amen. That's just one aspect. Mm -hmm. But either way, they have this great victory. God, and so they said, hey, those people who didn't do anything, let's put them to death. What in the world? Verse 13. Notice what Saul says. And Saul said, there shall not be a man put to death this day. For today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. So Saul gave all the glory and all the results to the Lord. He didn't ascribe it to himself. Amen. He said, look how great king I am. He says, look how good God is. Amen. Look how good God is. And, 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 and uh, where am I at? Verse uh, 14. Then said Samuel to the people, come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. It was because the Lord brought salvation to Israel that the mm -hmm. Lord rescued Israel, right? Amen. Because he's still their God. He didn't <clears throat> forsake his people. And, you know, that revealed something of the uh, men's hearts towards Saul, which was what? They were starting to see him differently now. They were starting to see him uh, uh, as in a different light, uh, as someone that they would be their king, right? He was already anointed. They said God saved the king, but now there was a test to prove his kingship, I guess. And, and so uh, now these men are looking at Saul and say, hey, this is a guy that I can respect. This is a guy that I can follow. This is a guy that I could die for. Amen. I have a, uh, a first sergeant, and his name, I would never say it to him in face to face, but I'll tell you his first name is Simon Sandoval. First Sergeant Sandoval. He was a Puerto Rican man. He never got my name right until I told him you had to say it with some soul. Juan Dell. Not Waddell, not Wandell, but Juan Dell. And ever since I told him that, that's how he always said it. But I would follow that man into hell if I had to, as a Marine. Just, that's just how much respect I had for him. He got bumped up in rank. He was really only a gunnery sergeant, but was acting as a first sergeant in Afghanistan. And he was just a man that I would follow. And these men of Israel saw a man of war, a king, who would go with them to battle and said, that's someone I can follow. Amen. That's someone who I can have respect for. So Samuel there, after the great victory, Saul desired that the men go to Gilgal. They go back to Gilgal to renew the kingdom. And verse 15 says... And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices and peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Amen. So there in Gilgal they made Saul king. Uh, Saul didn't make himself king. They just confirmed his leadership because of that victory. They said, hey, okay, we understand what God has chosen Kind of, we're, we're agreeing with this. Kind of like when a man gets ordained, he gets chosen of God, he, he heeds to the call, and the church ordains him, saying, hey, we understand the call of God in his life. Amen? Amen. It's kind of like what they were doing here with Saul. And so Saul fulfilled and passed the test with flying colors. Amen? And they sacrificed peace offerings, and they all rejoiced greatly. Big happy ending, right? Amen. So then you ask yourselves, okay, that's a great story, Pastor. What does this have to do with me? I'm glad you asked. It's many things, but primarily obedience. Amen. Obedience. Uh, we too have a king, do we not? We too have a king. Amen. And that king is kingdom rules in our hearts of those Amen. subjects. His subjects, those children of God, those who have been blood washed by the Lamb, born again by the Spirit of God, Christ is our king. We call him King Jesus, right? Amen. King Jesus is coming. Today may be the day. We have a song that sings that. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. He's the only one. There's none other like him. And unlike Saul, our king doesn't threaten us to do anything for him. Amen. Right? right? right. Jesus doesn't say, does, Jesus doesn't say, hold a gun to your head and say, you better write, uh, um, thinking of this young lady, 15 pages of music right now. Right? He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, hey, you better go soul winning and lead 15 people to the Lord. He, does, he doesn't do that. Unlike Saul, our king doesn't threaten us to do anything for him. Amen. Our king just says, follow thou me. Our king says, ye shall be witnesses. Amen. Our king says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Our king says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Our king says, come and dine. Come and dine. Amen. King Jesus doesn't threaten, he only commands. Why? I'm glad you asked. Go to Colossians chapter 4. Actually, Colossians chapter 1. Excuse me. Don't listen to that other guy. 
Colossians chapter 1. King Jesus doesn't threaten, he just commands. And whatever he commands and whatever he says will be accomplished, whether you like it or not. Amen. He expects that we do what he says to do in his word, not because he's going to slay some oxen. Jesus himself says, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is king of Amen. kings and Lord of lords. He's above Amen. all. For, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers in the, of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is, what? Before all things. Amen. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in how many things? All, All things. things he may have the preeminence. He is high and lifted up. He must increase, John the Baptist would say, but I must decrease. Amen. I'm not worthy to unloose the latchet of his shoe. King Jesus will have, unlike Saul, a voluntary military. Mm -hmm. A volunteer military. So I ask you this morning, are you willing to volunteer? Are you yeah, willing yeah. to volunteer? Hallelujah. Will you enlist in the fight for the cause of truth and right? If you're saved this morning, you've already been enlisted. Amen? If you're saved, you've already been enlisted. But have you taken up your cross and followed Christ? That's the question. How are you serving King Jesus? It's not our job to save people, amen? It's our job to be faithful in telling people of the saving message. He does all the saving. Amen? He does all the saving. You just do what you can do with the skills that God has given you. Amen. And his spirit that he's given you, a, at least one spiritual gift, to use in his church to profit with all. Not just for yourself, not to just hoard to your own self, but to use that gift with fervency, with zeal, and with an obedient heart. Amen. Just as God gave Saul a new heart when he anointed him as king, God gave Saul another heart, the Bible says, in chapter 10. God can remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Will you let him? Will you let him? We, we just read there in verse, in verse um, 14 of Colossians 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, purchasing back. How? How, can, how did he do that? Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Lost person, you whose king is Satan... You whose father is the devil, the lust of your father you will do. Because the Bible says, for if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Amen. So you are not of this kingdom of which I've been speaking on, which we're barely taking part of here. You are part of the kingdom of darkness. He would say, verse 13, who have delivered us from the power of darkness. That's the kingdom of darkness. Because why? Your sin has separated you from God. Amen. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there is none righteous, no, not one. Amen. Nobody is perfect as God. Nobody even comes close to the righteousness and perfectness yeah, of God. And, and the wages of sin is death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which burned the brimstone. Amen. Amen. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, that he, he tells us that, but that all should come to repentance. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. When Christ died for our sins, through him and the forgiveness of sins, we have redemption through him. But just because he went into the ground, that's great. But God confirmed it in the resurrection. Amen. And then he gave us the receipt, said, I approve of this uh, sacrifice through my son. And the grave could not hold him. And declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a covering through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. God is holding out to you, and he's holding out to the world today, Amen. a mercy seat. Praise the Lord. A place of mercy. Remember the publican that was over here? He says, God, be merciful, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Is there any mercy? Is, is there some place I could be found? Right? Remember the mercy seat, the high priest would go and sprinkle the blood upon it. Jesus Christ, our high priest, sprinkled the blood once and for all. Amen. And Jesus is holding out at the place of mercy and says, I'll give you life if you but ask. Amen. If you but receive. If you but Amen. believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So cast yourself upon the mercy of God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And thou shalt be saved. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Amen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. The blood of bulls and goats was, was never, he never took pleasure in that. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. God will not despise. He does not reluctantly save us. God does not reluctantly save anyone. Amen. Amen. He saves you wholeheartedly. He saves you abundantly. He saves you uh, wholly. And he will fully pardon if you but receive Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning, the Bible says, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. Yep. And this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son, not he that hath a baptism, not he that hath a rosary, not he that hath a thousand dollars in his bank account, God help us, uh, not he that has anything, he that has the Son hath life. Amen. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's the life. It's in his Son. Will you come to him today? Christian, I finish with this. Our Lord Jesus said, Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Anything that is that is done for our king, anything that we do for our Lord, must be by faith through Christ, by the power that is given to each believer through the person of the Holy Spirit that's indwelling us, right? Because without him, we would have no power at all. We couldn't do anything. Man, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Are you obeying the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you obeying the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you bringing a reproach upon your Savior? Are you bringing shame? Are you bringing disgrace upon your Savior? Is there something that he, maybe in particular service, he wants you to do, but you've refused to do for some time? Maybe it's just one little thing that God says, I want you to do Fill in the blank. I, you should be doing... I've been telling you this for X amount of years. I've been telling you this for X amount of months or X amount of weeks or X amount of hours. I want you to be doing this. You're focused on this. Your focus needs to be seek ye first the kingdom of God and His Amen. righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Don't worry about all those things. Why don't you focus on me? Focus on Christ. What are you doing for Christ? How about you repent of that wickedness that you are doing now and turn to the Lord? Repent of that and turn to the Lord. Why not just tell him that, hey, God, King Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll follow you wherever you need me to go and be all you can be in the Lord's army. Amen? I just said Lord's Marines. But be all you can be in him, through him, and to him, and for him. Amen? Amen. Why? Because he's deserving of all. Amen. Right? Uh, he that the, he that died, he, he told us, right, in his word, paraphrasing, but he says, look, we're, we're all dead. If he died for all, all were dead. Amen. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which bought them and died. Amen. We live for God. Not with eye service as men pleasers. We're not trying to please anybody. We don't go clean a toilet. Hey, Chad, do you see me in here? I'm cleaning. I'm not, we don't do that with men pleasers. We do it obediently Amen. from the heart. We do the will of God from the heart. The Bible would say, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, uh, and reason which is your reasonable service, right? And be not conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world out here, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can I know God's will? How can I know what he wants me to do? He's given you a book. Amen. Amen. Follow the book. Do Amen. what King Jesus says. Amen? Do what King Jesus says. So I wonder this morning, Christian, are you obeying Jesus from the heart? Or are you serving him in truth with all your heart? 1 Samuel 12, 24, my life verse. For consider how great things he has done for you. Only serve the Lord in truth. Amen. Only serve the Lord in truth and fear him. For consider how great things he has done for you. Are you serving King Jesus?
Are you doing something for him in his kingdom today?